Hi, I'm Matt Chandler here, pastor of the Village Church. Just want to thank you for streaming uh, this sermon uh, on your device. Uh, I, I wanted to, just before we get going here, uh, just lay before you a deep conviction we have that this video sermon uh, that we've prayed really stirs up your affections for Jesus and shapes you and molds you into the image uh, of the Son um, would just be supplemental to your relationship with the Lord and in no way would replace the church you should be plugged into or the pastor that God has put over your life to shepherd and care for your soul. And so please uh, enjoy the next hour or so uh, of this message. We have prayed that God would use it in a profound way in your life. Blessings. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father Almighty. From whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab those. Uh, Romans chapter 10 is where we're going to camp out. Uh, just really two verses there that we're going to just uh, pick apart for the next 40 minutes or so. Uh, but before we get started, this is promotion weekend, which means we have a handful of sixth graders uh, in here with us, finally, uh, in big church. And so if you're a sixth grader, will you uh, lift your hands for me? Uh, in fact, why don't you go ahead and just stand up? I know this is, if you wrestle with anxiety, this is probably terrifying. But if you're a sixth grader, go ahead and stand up. Even if you're at Plano or Fort Worth or Dallas, six Sixth graders. I know this could be really weird. Maybe there's not any sixth graders even in here. Um, but if you're watching me on this, but hey, let me talk to you just for a second, sixth graders. We love that you're in here with us, right? Uh, you bring, uh, and I say this all the time, as men and women get older, they get crustier, not more fun. Uh, and, and you, you with your love for life, your zeal and your squirminess, um, remind us of what's really important and what's not. And so just as your pastor, I love that you're in here. Welcome. I've been giddy this week just knowing you would be here. In fact, we prayed for you earlier tonight uh, before um, we, we got ready to do all that we were going to do. And, and our prayer was that your love and energy would be contagious for us. And so um, welcome. So we're going to uh, do 12 weeks on the Apostles' Creed. And here's what I know. Let's just let's chat. Let's just talk about it, right? Uh, here's what I know. Those of you who have more liturgical backgrounds, maybe you're a former Catholic or, a, or an Anglican or grew up in a Presbyterian, Reformed Presbyterian church or something like that, like you're geeked out of your mind right now, right? You're like, is this, can you even do this? Is he allowed to do this? Or I thought, I thought we weren't allowed to do creeds, right? And, and if you're a modern Baptist, not a historic Baptist, because historic Baptists were also creedal people, but if you're a modern Baptist and you've heard something like, no creed but the Bible, then you're probably concerned about me right now and wondering what the world the elders are thinking and how could they let him do this and how do we shut it down, right? And so there, there's this mixture of excitement and nervousness um, in the room about the Apostles' Creed. But here, let, let's just, uh, again, talk very briefly. Um, what I want to do tonight or in today in our time together is I just want to tell you why we would spend um, 12 weeks on the Apostles' Creed. And I can give you my outline right out of the gate, and then we're going to very quickly get get to the Bible, all right? Um, but uh, here's my outline. The, the creed will help us develop better symmetry as Christians, give us a, a more robust understanding of the God of the Bible. The, the creed helps us with clarity. It makes it clear who God is. The, the creed informs uh, our community, who, who we belong to and who we are with. And then finally, the creed informs our counsel, both to ourselves and to others. So again, uh, the Apostles' Creed, right, is going to 
to by the grace of God, through the Spirit of God, and, and we'll get to the Bible and all that in just a, a second, is going to um, help us with symmetry, clarity, community, and counsel. So with that said, that's what we're going to talk about in our time together today, but with that said, three little caveats that I haven't decided yet, but I might say every intro for the next 12 weeks. Here's what they are. It's important to know that I have no intention of preaching the creed, but rather using the creed to preach the Bible. And, And here's why. Creeds do not function, do not hold any authority in and of themselves, but rather they point outside of themselves to the ultimate authority of the word of God. All right, so maybe this is a helpful illustration. The moon is awesome to look at. It has no light of its own, but it tells me there's a light out there, right? If you're sixth grade, hadn't learned that yet, and you're like, what? All right, here's what's happening, right? The, the sun, all right, is casting out, radiating heat and light, and that hits the surface of the moon and reflects to us so that we look up and we see light reflecting off the moon. Well, the creed is reflecting the light of the word of God. So that the creed has no authority in and of itself, and, and, and I would never preach it like it does, but rather it points back to the authority that is the word of God. And so it's gonna be helpful for you to keep that in your head, really, at all times. Secondly, um, the creed's historic use has primarily been twofold. All right, the church has been using, this is the oldest of the Christian creeds, uh, and, and it's been used in two ways historically. The, the first is to correct error, right? God's people have a tendency at times uh, to drift into what is not true about God, and the creed corrects that, but it's also been used and primarily been used as a tool in the spiritual formation of God's people, that the Apostles' Creed has been used by the church for two millennia to shape the people of God around what is true. Now, uh, if you're here and you're not a Christian or you're not quite sure what to make out of all of this, let me just say this very quickly. Um, Christians do not believe in incantations. Here's what I mean by that. You saying this along with us, you saying this will not make you a Christian. You knowing this and memorizing this does not make you a Christian, okay? So with, with those three things uh, before us, all right, it's, it's not the Bible, all right? It, it's not. It has no authority in and of itself, but rather it reflects the light and heat of the Bible. It's been used to correct error and to shape God's people, and it's, an, it's, it's not an incantation that will save you, make you lucky, get you a promotion, get you that girl that you've been staring at. It just doesn't work that way. Okay, now with that said, I, I want to read the Apostles' Creed, okay? Um, and then from there, just know later on in our service, we're going to all stand and we're going to read it together. And if you're not a Christian, don't be wigged out like that. You can just stand and not read anything at all, or you can just stay seated. But we're going to stand near the end of the message today, and we're going to make this a habit over the course of the next 12 weeks to stand and read this together as the people of God. But before we dive in, let me just read the Apostles' Creed to you. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. That's going to be a fun week. Uh, And the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father Almighty from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Amen or amen, depending on your background. So with that said, let's look at Romans chapter 10, 9 through 10 are the verses we're going to look at. And again, which is what we're doing. Symmetry, clarity, community, and counsel. So that's what we're doing. Let, let's look first in Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 9. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord... And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, verse 10 is huge. Pay close attention. 
For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So there's two pieces here, and it's important that we see and understand and grab hold of both of them before we consider the creed in any way. Now, here's the first one. What we have here is a confession that Jesus is Lord, a type of pledge of allegiance to. So I grew up in the day and age before it was un-American to say the pledge of allegiance to America in your schoolroom. And so I grew up putting my, and grew up in San Francisco. Yeah, we, we stood up, put our hand over our heart and said, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, right? I, I know the whole thing, but I'm going to cut it there for time's sake. Now this is, I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. He's the Lord of my life. My allegiance is to Christ. And so I might say the pledge to the United States. Uh, I might do some other, but my allegiance is to Jesus. My confession is that Jesus is the Lord of my life. And so maybe you're in here and you're a nominal Christian. If there is such a thing, I get confused thinking about that. And you go, oh man, I believe in Jesus. I'll confess it right now. Jesus is Lord. Looks like I'm saved. I mean, you're just a little too quick on the pool there. Let's keep reading the text. Look back at 10. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So there's an order by which belief and confession occurs. And so in the first part of the text, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. But if you look at the context of Scripture, here's what you find out. Notice that the text does not say, I mean, you're going to look at it, it does not say No, it says believe. It doesn't say that I know Jesus is Lord. It says I believe that Jesus is Lord. Now, why is that important? It's important because believing, belief leads to action and knowing may or may not. Quick survey. How many of you know things you should be doing, shouldn't be doing, and that has not stopped you from doing them or not doing them? Go ahead. This is universal. If you don't have your hand up right now, you're a liar. Right? This is universal. To believe is to be moved upon towards action. And to know is to, yeah, maybe, maybe not. And so the word here is not to know in your heart. It's to believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. And then that leads to justification, right? Right standing before God, which then leads ultimately to a confession with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. We don't confess with our mouth and that save us. We believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord. And then that leads to a confession with our mouth. That order is imperative for you to understand what the gospel is, right? It's important that he's saying you believe, not that you know. Now, um, here's something to consider. If you're in our theological training program, you're hearing some of this right now. It's it's so important. Um, What we see in this text and what we try to teach you around any kind of theological belief is that human beings are not primarily thinking creatures, I'm not saying that we don't think and spend a lot of time thinking. I'm saying that we are primarily creatures driven by our loves, right? And so although we do think, no amount of kind of just intellectual information necessarily transforms or moves you, but rather when the heart believes, when the loves are aligned. This goes back to what we taught last week. And when there's adoration, like you do what you love, You chase what you love. You grab hold of what you love and what you think will satisfy you. You are driven by your affections. Any other understanding of what drives you is incorrect. It's incorrect. So it's the heart that must believe, not just the mind, because that would be knowing. Belief is birthed in the heart. And something to know, the reason the creed begins with I believe and not I know is he. the creed has tied itself anchored itself to the gospel. All other moral religions, all right, are you tracking with me on moral religions? All other moral religions say, here's the bar, good luck. Here's the bar, you got to measure up. So any of the world's moral religions, even philosophies of living, all right, are here's the bar, measure up to it. So if you buy into the narrative of materialism, here's the bar, live up to it. If you buy into the need to be perfect, like say the the Muslims do, or that here's the bar, live up to it, right? But that's not Christianity. In fact, the moment Paul teaches this, 
all right, to the church in Rome and really across the ancient world. He separates Christianity out from all the other world's religions by starting not with we do, but rather I believe so that the message of the Christian faith isn't that we have done anything, but rather we have believed that someone has. That's the difference between the gospel and all other moral religion. And it's why our hearts as believers in Christ should be made alive that we're not chained to rote religious activity, but we have a savior who has accomplished all that we desire for us. I believe, I believe. So uh, again, the reason we're going to look at the creed for 12 weeks is because it's going to, by the grace of God, wrung out of scripture create symmetry, going to create clarity, community, and counsel. So let's start with symmetry. Quick survey in the room. How many of you at some point of your life worked out consistently at a workout place? Go ahead and raise your hands. Oh, praise God. Okay. So what about um, Fort Worth, Dallas, Plano workout? I know Dallas does. Just so pretty down there. Anyway, um, now here's the thing about if you've ever worked out consistently at a gym. In every gym, regardless, and I even will try to hit up a gym traveling sometimes, right? So in every gym out there, there is a man working out that's shaped like an upside down pear with two toothpicks jammed into its bottom. You know what I'm talking about? So you take a pear, turn it upside down, stick two toothpicks on it, and there's a man in that gym that looks like that. And here's what he has done, right? He, has, he wants a chest and some abs and some arms, and he just doesn't like doing his legs. And so that dude will sometimes be wearing like pants at the gym, right? He's like sweating to death, but he's got on, you know, it's like some gym pants because he, he knows he's a pair with two toothpicks jammed into the bottom of it, right? And it's important that you know that the pair has been turned upside down, right? Now here's what's happened. He's now asymmetrical. And because he's, because he's, he doesn't have the right symmetry, although he feels like he looks good. Here's what we know. We know he's weaker than he thinks he is. And we know that even though he can bench press 400 pounds, I could shove him over with my gangly self because he has no base. He has no root. He has no power because power in the human body is birthed out of the glutes and the hams and the hip flex, right? That's all your powers down here. So brother, you can keep doing bench flies all day long, but you better blow up those legs or you're in trouble. Now, the same thing happens to us spiritually, Right? We get out of symmetry. We get out of the robust build out that God desires for our soul to possess. And so let me give you out of the creed, um, and therefore uh, I'll tie it to the Bible in the weeks to, to come, how we can get out of symmetry as Christians. So say um, some of you in here, your understanding of what it means to be a Christian is that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior. He is your personal Lord and Savior. Now, just like doing upper body. That's great. That's true. True. You should believe that. You should love that. In fact, I will, I desire earnestly for you to understand that God sees you. Jesus sees you as an individual, as a person. But man, you're not lined up with biblical symmetry if you don't understand that you also belong to the Holy Catholic Church. Catholic there mean universal, right? The Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. See, when we get to that week, some of you are going to have your understanding of Christianity lined up. You're going to have a leg day, if you will. All right, and, and let's say maybe that's not you. Maybe you're just really dialed in to the historicity of Jesus Christ. You love the Gospels. You love Jesus. That's a good thing. You can tell all the stories um, from uh, the Gospels. You love the woman at the well. Man, you love when Jesus walks on the water. You love when he tells dead people they're not allowed to be dead. You love how he reads the minds of the Pharisees and calls them out. You love all that about him, and yet somewhere along the way, you've lost sight of the fact that Jesus is still alive. He has ascended. He is seated at the right hand of God. And then we worship not a former dead Messiah, but a living Messiah who right now, as we're in here, is alive. And not in some spiritual form. He's alive. And we need to be reminded that's going to be just a, yet another leg day for us, if you will, if that illustration will hold true. So, so this is what's going to do. It's going to help with symmetry. We could do this throughout the creed, but this is what the creed's going to help us do by the grace of God, right? It's going to help form 
symmetry. It's also going to help us with some clarity. Um, Ligonier Ministries partnered with Lifeway Christian Resources on a massive survey about evangelical belief, about uh, the doctrine of God, um, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, sin, the Bible. Like, what do evangelicals believe about these things? And needless to say, the the survey was called, um, What is Our Theological Temperature? You can look all this up online. And, and the survey revealed um, th- some disturbing beliefs among um, evangelical Christians in the United States. So it's important to know these, these are United States-centric beliefs. Um, so the survey revealed significant confusion regarding the doctrine of God. And, and so let me unpack that to you when I say the doctrine of God. Large swatches of evangelical Christians deny that Jesus is God in the flesh. They deny the deity of Christ. They deny that the Holy Spirit is a person. They think it's some sort of ethereal presence and not a person. In fact, it it gets worse. The survey revealed that half, less than half, of evangelical Americans think the Bible is the word of God and that it is true. These same numbers, this should be no surprise, reject what the Bible has to say on ethical issues. Well, of course they do. It has no uh, authority, right? And then finally... um, The survey also revealed that many evangelicals in the United States feel that worshiping alone is just as valid as attending corporate worship in the church. So again, these are muddy waters here. What you believe about God, what you think about when you think about God, the Z.W. Tozer, is the most important thing in the universe. What you think about when you think about God is the most important thing you'll ever think. And what it seems is that by and large, American evangelicals are terribly confused about who God is, what he's up to, what he's like, what he's about. It seems like we've, we've lost our way. And, I, and there's a couple of reasons we've lost our way. One, one we ask the wrong questions all the time. Um, and, and so I, I think pragmatism rules the day. Are you tracking with me when I say pragmatism? Like, like pragmatics, like um, what I need right now, right? There's no, there's no real thirst or hunger for spiritual formation as God's designed it to be, which is you, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, walking and growing obedience to the Word of God or God as He's revealed Himself in the Word and through our highs and lows, He shapes us and molds us. Really, what we've bought into is a real weird, over over-romanticized, over-emotionalized version of Christianity that is no historic Orthodox Christianity at all. We want to be fixed right now. All right, look, it's taken me 20 years to jack up my marriage. You tell me right now how to make it better. We, we want it now, and, and we're driven by that now, and we also, God help us, we want to be entertained. We don't want to participate. We want to witness. And not give witness to, but just, hey, entertain me, dance for me. And, and I know this because of the things we say when we talk about church. It, one of the things that breaks my I have a daughter who's in seventh grade. What do you think most parents ask their kids when they pick them up after Bible study? Do you have fun? As if fun rules and navigates our lives. And I know the whole deal about, well, if they think it's fun, they'll want to come. But here's the thing. I don't think it just stops with kids. I think adults are like, was it fun? Is church fun? (laughs) It's not meant to be fun. It's meant to be formative. That means there's a lot of joy there. I've worked hard for a decade with you to tease out the ideas of happiness and joy. Because I love you and happiness is cheap and fragile and you'll break it just thinking about it. But joy's not like that. Joy's deep-rooted. It it can't be pulled up very easily. Joy can't be jostled by circumstance like happiness can. That's why the people of God need a rootedness in joy and not, do you have a good time? And listen, you know, I love to have a good time. Call me, I'll have a good time with you. But the purpose of the gathering of the children of God is to grow in rootedness. And let's laugh along the way and let's experience joy, but let's not pretend and God help us, let's not teach our children that it being fun is the bar that things must measure up on. So you get clarity, you get symmetry, and then you get community. Um, I I think you you probably noticed 
Um, we've been very purposeful with everything from the font that we used for the Apostle Creed to the images around it. Because here, here's why. I, I, I'm trying so hard, and I don't know how to do it. I'm just, just going to confess. I don't know how to, to dial you in to how big this thing is that you're wrapped up in. Like we're a part of a people that's been around for thousands and thousands of years. We're a part of a people that go back to the beginning of mankind where God has called people unto himself. And we're a part of that. We're a historic people. Throughout history, God's people, his elect, his, those he has called to himself, they've thrived. They've worshipped him. They've, we're a part of that tradition. We're a global people. People all over the earth this weekend will gather because they believe this. And they'll rejoice in it and they'll be shaped by it. And massive swatches of them will actually recite this together. See, you and I have been woven into something so much bigger than us that that fabric created by God makes us stronger than any of us will ever be on our own. It's diverse it's beautiful. It's global. So the reason you're seeing some gothic images and some images from the 50s is because um, when our brothers and sisters got together and read this out loud in the first, second, third centuries, we're a part of them, that this isn't new, that we're not stumbling. It's just our turn to run a faithful race. It forms a community, forms a community. And here's something else I want you to, to think about. The other thing about the community that the creed forms being pulled from the word of God is as Christianity has enjoyed such favor the last 150 or so years in the U.S. and as it's now starting to fall out of favor, defining ourselves by secondary beliefs will, I, begin, I believe, begin to fade away. And, and here's what I mean by that. The creed shows us what's primary. All right? And that if we are a creedal people, we believe the Apostles' Creed. We start, I believe, and we believe the things that the creed says. That, that means our family is a lot bigger than we think we are. That right? means our family goes beyond the borders of Baptist. Some of you are like, we're Baptist? Surprise, <laughs> right? Um, so you're like, wait, we're, we're singing, we're doing a creed in a Baptist church? I mean, pff, right? So yes. Um, so ultimately, the family is just bigger than, than we think it is, and and that's what's happening in this community. It's, uh, it's historic. It's multi-ethnic. It's global. It's historical. And we're caught up in it. It's a really beautiful thing. So you've got symmetry. You've got clarity. You've got community. And then finally, you have counsel. And, and so when I say counsel, that the creed helps our counsel, what, what I'm saying is it affects how you counsel yourself and how you counsel others. So again, from the creed, let me give you some examples. If you believe that Christ will return to judge the living and the dead, that's going to affect how you counsel yourself, right? Right? So if you believe, and remember, belief isn't I know, it's not this kind of, yeah, I know Christ will return, he's going to bring judgment. I, it's not that, it's I believe it, like down in my gut, out of my heart, leading to confession of mouth, I believe that Christ will return to judge the living and the dead. Now think of the ammunition that is against sin. Think about how you counsel yourself. Think about how you counsel others if you believe that Christ is going to return to judge the living and the dead. It's going to affect how you counsel yourself. It's going to affect how you counsel others. It's going to grow you in an understanding of the person of God and the work of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, and you're going to counsel yourself differently. And then how about, I think, the easiest one in the creed. I think you can do this with any sentence in the creed. But if you, look right at me. If you believe in the forgiveness of sins, does that change how you counsel yourself? See, here's what's happened this week. You, you ready? And I'm, I'm just going to be bold. You've sinned this week. We've sinned this week. I've been right there with you. Varying levels, varying degrees, we've sinned. We've said cruel things to our spouse. We have not loved the Lord. We have given ourselves over to certain sins, maybe historic sins that we wrestle with. And if you're not a Christian here, you're like, it kind of sounds like my week too. Yeah, so welcome. You should feel welcome here. We're just there. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you believe in the forgiveness of sins, then you don't run and hide from the forgiver. You run to him. 
How you counsel yourself is not, I've blown it. Let me run and hide. I don't want anybody to know that. I don't want, let me just pretend that that didn't happen. Let me try hard not to do that again. No, no, no. You believe in the forgiveness of sins. So you run to him. I failed you. Forgive me knowing that he'll forgive. You run to him, not from him. And if you believe in the forgiveness of sins, how will you walk with those who sin against you? More graciously, right? How about this one? Since I, I didn't ask you for this one, this one will be easier for you. How many of you uh, feel like you've been sinned against this week? Really? I was expecting more of a unanimous one, like 12 of you, right? You guys I must run in awesome circles. It's really godly circles, right? So when we are sinned against and we believe in the forgiveness of sins, not only are we recipients of that forgiveness, but we begin to extend that forgiveness. And, and so as we look at what the church fathers and 2,000 years of Christian faith has recited and rejoiced in, pulled from the word of God, we're going to pray that the Holy Spirit of God um, develop some symmetry in our hearts about how to think rightly about him, how to think about who he is, how to worship correctly. We're going to gain some clarity Lord willing, we're going to understand and embrace the community and we'll grow in our counsel both to ourselves and to one another. And, and so here's what I want to do now. I'd love for us to stand, if you're able, um, and we're going to quote the creed together. And so we're going to say this out loud. Uh, our voices is what will fill the room. So even if you're in Fort Worth or Plano or Dallas, we're going to stand. We're just going to quote the creed together like our brothers and sisters in Christ have done globally for close to two millennia. So here we go. We're going to quote it together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father Almighty, from which he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Won't you have a seat? Now, when the early church recited this. Here, here's something to think about. When the early church recited this, it was simultaneously their greatest act of rebellion and their greatest act of allegiance happening simultaneously. And so when the church gathered and they stood not in an air-conditioned room protected by rule of law, but when they stood across the, the, the centuries, not knowing who would come in, not, not being watched and who's reciting this, they rejected did the popular narratives of their day, whatever their day was. So in Rome, they rejected that Caesar was Lord, all right? They rejected the, the narrative of the first century and said, no, 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 no. I reject that. I believe that Jesus is Lord. And so simultaneously, they rejected the narrative of their day and they embraced, put their allegiance upon the God of the Bible. It's this beautiful moment when the people of God recited this creed. They said, we don't believe the story that our culture's telling. That, that story has some similarities, but it's changed throughout human history. And in our day, we would say, by reciting this, we, we hopefully, by, if we believe, we're saying we reject the narrative of materialism. We just reject it. We reject that stuff will satisfy our souls. We're saying we reject the notion that what I need to be physically satisfied is more and more and more partners. I reject that. I reject that. I reject that there's not a way, but there's everybody has their own. We just fundamentally reject that narrative. Our narrative is that we believe in the God of the Bible. And so when the church recites this creed, right, distilled, pulled from, wrung out of the word of God, we're saying we reject the modern narrative. 
We believe the historic narrative, the narrative that God has come into the world to save sinners, that Jesus Christ has died for our sins. And we believe and trust that he has made known to us the path of life. Um, Years ago, I was in college, so years ago, uh, when I was in college, my brother-in-law um, was, I believe, in high school. I'll, I'll get clarity on this story after this service. Probably should have done it before, but the people, some of the people involved are actually in the room, so um, don't stand up in front of me about this now. Do it after the service. Um, my father-in-law had bought a house. My father and mother-in-law had, had bought a house. Um, my mother-in-law is a realtor. Father-in-law is just, let me, he's just cooler than all of us, so um, he, he, they bought a house in, uh, I think it was called um, White House or White Oak or something like that in East Texas, and they bought the house. And what they were going to do is Johnny was going to use his man skills on it, right? Put in new floors and and you know open up doorways, and he was just going to make it look amazing. And they were just going to try to flip the house. Many of you watch this as entertainment now, right? Um, and so I happen to be in town, and what I want is I want Johnny's daughter to marry me. And so I'm like, you need help at the house now. If you knew how impossible me helping with any type of skill. And so Johnny, God bless his heart, just gave me and my um, future brother-in-law this project. There were some, um, some really high kind of hackberry bushes. Right? I mean, they looked like they'd been there um, since America was founded and they, they had used them um, as, you know, right along their fence. And, and so our job was to get those hackberry bushes up. And so uh, the tools of the trade were a shovel, uh, an axe, some clipper things for the root. And, and man, we went to work and, and man, we worked and worked and worked and those things weren't moving. I mean, they laughed at the ax, they laughed at the shovel, they laughed. So what happens when you have a college student and a high school student and a Chevy Z71 with four-wheel drive and a chain on it is we very quickly just put uh, the, all of that aside and we got in the truck and we backed it down the drive and we wrapped a, a chain uh, around um, really the hitch and then wrapped it around the bush and we got it in and, and we didn't even think to drop it in four low yet. Right, And then we just, mm, and, and we tried to just kind of, and they still kind of fought us. So then we had to put some slack and just like, bam, and, and try to rip the things out of the ground. And that was the only possible way to get them out of the ground. Probably not, but that's the way we did it, right? <laughs> now, the reason those bushes were near impossible to get out of the ground is because of how long they'd been there and how deep the roots went. See, when there's deep rootedness, hard freezes don't tend to kill. And storms don't tend to uproot. Where there's deep rootedness, there's stability and fruitfulness. And when I talk about joy over happiness, that's what I'm talking about. And the opportunity we have for the next 12 weeks gathering together is by the grace of God. It's the only way it'll happen, by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, that he might root us more deeply in who he is. See, the, the creed goes contrary to popular thinking. This isn't about you at all. It's all about him. And what I mean by pragmatism is people don't like that. They want the sermon to be all about them. But that's not how the people of God have ever been formed. They've been formed by staring at, marveling at, being blown away by who their God is. We have the opportunity for deep rootedness. I'm hungry for it. Let's pray. Father, Again, I thank you for these men and women, an opportunity to come tonight. And, and, and really all we've done today is we've um, talked about you, we've sung about you, we've considered you, we're gonna respond to you. We pray over the course of the next 11 weeks now that you would help form us with greater symmetry, that we would see things that we weren't as dialed into and it would make us grow and, and grow in strength and grow in rootedness and depth. And, and we pray for clarity. There's some misunderstandings about who you are and what you're like and, and the culture's telling one story and the Bible's telling us another. And I pray that you'd bring clarity to the greater story. And when you grow our confidence in you, as you've created a people that is 
spanned through history? Would you protect us from a type of weak progressivism that believes human history is always getting better? And would you root us deeply in your plan for mankind? And will you help us as we seek to counsel ourselves and counsel others? Father, some of us are in here, we sit in here week in and week out across these campuses, but we're verbally and emotionally abusive to our spouse. We're uh, addicted. We're currently flirting with, if not full on engaged with, another partner other than our spouse. And I pray that the creed, Father, that the word of God reflected out of the creed help us run from sin and run to you the better story help us we need you it's for your beautiful name i pray amen